I want us to go to Matthew chapter 24, and we'll start and find this question that is asked. We're going to go ahead and start in verse 3. And Jesus was coming to sit on the Mount of Olives, and the disciples came with him privately, saying, Tell us when shall these things be? And if you go up a couple verses, he's talking about when life is going to end. When is when is Jesus, when is when are you going to reign? When is when shall these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming? Look at the next phrase, and of the end. Everybody say the end. The end of the world. You ever been watching a, maybe a series or a, a movie, and you're like, oh, I feel the ending. It's coming. It's gonna, the ending's coming. Like, if you don't know the amount of time, how long the movie lasts, how many of you are good at guessing the end of a movie or a series? Are you good at that? You're not? Well, I'm pretty good at it, I think, anyway. Um, and I'll be watching this show, and I'll be like, okay, they're about to shut it off because they're leaving us hanging, right? They're leaving me hanging on a cliff here. I don't know what's going to happen in the next chapter. I don't know what's going to happen in the next little bit. And so they're going to leave me on this thread of, ah, man, I wanted to know what happens. What's very cool about Jesus is the ability that he has to capture his disciples' attention and really answer their questions. In chapter 24, it goes through quite a bit here, but we're going to skip over to chapter 25. And we're going to look at just one portion of the answer. You can study some of this yourself and find some more answers, I'm sure. But the one thing that we want to look at today as we begin is this one thought I want you to leave with. I have to keep it simple for me because um, I know I can't remember a whole lot, but if you could just remember this one phrase today as we leave, and that is to live with less so I can live with more. Everybody say that. Now tell the person next to you. Live with less so I can live with more. I'm not talking about green stuff or I'm not talking about uh, things that you pay for, you pay less for this or pay. How many of you are really good shoppers? You're a good bargain shopper. I mean, you don't buy anything unless it's on sale. Let me see your hand. Way up. All right. You don't buy anything unless it's a bargain, man. You You just don't do that. But what I'm talking about is something along that lines, but what I'm talking more about is living with less time doing this or less time doing that, so I have more time to do this or more time to do that. Less time with maybe uh, this scenario, so I have more time to be with my family. Less time with this particular part of my life, so I have more time for uh, getting invested, right? We're talking about I'm invested in the vision and ways that I'm going to be able to invest with this area of of my life that I know God wants me to invest in. So live with less so I can live with more. When life is all done, when as we go back to the question that was asked, when is the end of the world going to come? When is the end going to be for me specifically or personally? When's the end going to be for you? We don't know when that end's going to be. Do you know when the end of your life is going to be? Anybody? Nobody, right? We don't know this. So when is the end going to be? What is going to matter at the end? And what am I investing in? I know um, Stacy was telling me about a conversation she had with one of our ladies, and they were talking about how that, okay, this is your goal. This is where you want to be uh, financially uh, at this certain age. Well, then we we can start now and see, okay, in 10 years we can backtrack and see how much you're going to have to do between now and then to get where you want to be. You know, backtracking, finding out what is it going to take to get there. The investment of your life, what is it going to take to get there? The first thing I want to share with us this morning, we're going to find as we start here in chapter 25, verse 14. I want you to follow along and soak in these words. I want you to look for certain words that stand out to you. Many times when we hear someone read, we don't necessarily read ourselves. We just say, okay, I'm listening to them. But I want you to listen to the Spirit of God this morning. Ask God to show you what what words, what verbs, what nouns stick out to you about this passage and what Jesus is saying to his disciples on this certain subject. Let me start in 14. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. So whose goods were they? They were his goods, not their goods. So he delivers them. They got the goods, verse 15. 
And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one. So what's the numbers? Five to one. Many of you know this story. To every man according to his several ability. So it's, it's very cool how God gives them specific things to specific people for certain reasons and straightway took his journey. So the master leaves. In verse 16, then he that had received five talents went and traded. Did it say he waited at all? Did it say anything about waiting? Did it say anything about um, coming up with a really good plan uh, before he went? He just went and was going to allow this thing just to unfold. So he went and he began to trade with the same and he made them other five talents. How many of you are glad that you can make some money every once in a while? Doesn't that feel good to have a little money in your pocket? If it, if it does, say amen. amen. That feels good, right? But living with less so I can live with more, here's what he's saying in this particular part. He's saying, go and do the work. He went and traded, did the work, and likewise, he had received two. He also gained other two. So we see the second, second guy does the same thing. And he that received one went and digged. What did he do? He digged. That's right. You can talk to me. Help me out. This makes me go faster. He digged, right? What did he do? Oh, my word. Let's start over. He did what? He digged, right? What did he do? He digged. I want you to know he digged. All right? He didn't just go out and trade. He digged in the earth. And he, what did he do with it? He buried it. All right? So don't be laughing at me over there. I heard my daughter. When you dig, you bury something. You shouldn't be burying what your master gives you. You should be doing something with it. We know this. So what did he do in verse 18? He what? Yeah, okay, you all get there eventually. He digged. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. Everybody say reckoneth. Reckoneth with them. I want you to try to use that word this week. That'll be a challenge. Reckoneth. I need to reckoneth with you. So the master says, I want to reckon with you. What does he reckon with them about? Well, how things went. Let's keep going. In verse 20, And so he that hath received five talents came and brought other five talents. And look at what he says here. Lord, thou didst, or excuse me, thou, Lord, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Talents, behold, I have gained beside, or I have acquired beside these five talents more. His Lord said unto him, what's the next two words? He said, well done. And notice this, he says, thou good and faithful servant. He doesn't say good and profitable servant. He doesn't say good and fruitful servant. What does he say? Good and what? He says good and what? Faithful. Yeah, now you're helping me. Good and faithful servant. So not fruitful, not, not uh, someone who's uh, gaining a lot, but he just says, you've been good and faithful. Well done. He says, thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. It's great for us when we immediately obey. We are good and faithful with what God has given to us, and then we get the rewards of this joy. Joy is not just for the end. Joy is for now. Joy is not for just the end of my life, but it's for now. When I do something in obedience, I receive joy from that, knowing that the Master is pleased. If you've had joy before, say amen. You've had joy before. I've had joy before. I have joy because we're doing this. We're attempting this. We're investing in this life of doing what God has asked us to do. Let's keep going. Verse 22. Remember, this is Jesus talking, not someone uh, with great knowledge, but Jesus says, He also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Lord, these were from you. Behold, I have gained two other talents besides them. I've acquired more, Lord, with what you gave. His Lord said unto him again, those words we've heard before, Well done, thou good and faithful servant, thou hast been faithful over a few things. Notice the few things, I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the, again, the joy of thy Lord. Verse 24, Then he which had received one talent came and said, now I want you to notice the approach, okay? If you look back, again, looking at the scripture, looking back in verse 22, the one that had two talents said, Lord, thou deliverest. And the one that had five talents started out his conversation 
Lord, thou deliverest. Who's getting the credit for the talents they have? The Lord is, because he says, Lord, thou deliverest. You gave this to me. Lord, you gave this to me, so this is what I've done with it. You're reckoning with me. You're asking me what I've done. This is what I've done. Notice the last gentleman, how he responds first. He doesn't say, Lord, thou deliverest, does he? What does he say? He automatically starts defending himself because of why? He know he, he went, and what did he do? He digged. Everybody say, he digged. He digged. Say it again. He digged. he digged. Yeah, that's what he did. He went and he digged a hole, and he buried the talent. So he says, <laughs> thank you, Brownie. Uh, thou deliverest, all right, thou deliverest, to me, the first two guys, then the last guy says, Lord, I knew. He's already made this, he's already got a speech prepared. He's already got his defense ready. I mean, he's ready to defend himself. He knows he has not been good and faithful. And he says, Lord, I knew. I, I knew. What does it say? I knew that thou art a hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown. It seems like, Lord, no matter what you do, um, it, it blossoms and it it's better, and it's blessed. I know that no matter where you sow, it's, it's, it's going to come back. Reaping where that house not sown, gathering where that house not strawed. And look at the next couple words of 25. He says, and what's the next three words? Can you read those? I was afraid. So because he was afraid, what did he do earlier? He did, that's right. He digged and he buried what was given to him. So he buried it. He was afraid. That's why he digged and buried what he had been given. Verse 25, and he went and hid the talents in the earth. Lo, that's where they were. They were low. Low in the earth. There, ha there that hast is thine. 26, now, his Lord answered and said unto him, could you imagine hearing this? I don't want to hear this. Man, I don't want to hear this. Thou wicked and, what's the next word? Slothful servant. Thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not and gathereth where I have not strawed. He said, you knew what kind of blessings I could provide, but you still were afraid because of the enemy. And the enemy uh, worked on this gentleman. He was afraid, and he works on you and me to make us afraid to use our talents. And because of that, now he has nothing, and he's been, he's been reckoned with, all right? And he has been reckoned to be a wicked and slothful servant. Verse 27, thou oughtest. Everybody look at the person next to you and say, you shoulda. Say it loud, you shoulda. You shoulda. <laughs> you shoulda. You ought to. I hate to go back and hear those words. You know, Stacy tells me that a lot. You shouldn't. No, she doesn't. You ought to have done this. You should have done that. It's so hard to hear those words. Thou oughtest, therefore, to have put my money to the exchangers. This would have been the wiser choice. And then at my coming, I should have received mine own with usury. Take, therefore, the talent from him. If you don't use it, you what? You lose it. Take the talent from him and give it unto him that hath ten talents. For unto everyone that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away, even that he hath. And cast ye the, what's the next two words? Unprofitable. Everybody say unprofitable. I want to hear the youth say it. Youth say unprofitable. unprofitable. You guys got a long time to live. You don't have to be this guy. Just so you know. Unprofitable servant. Into outer darkness there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Just a small clarification at the end of this. This last servant truly was not a believer because where did he go? He went to eternal damnation. Weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. Have you ever seen anybody, even a small percentage of that in pain? How many of you have witnessed someone in extreme pain? I mean, you have witnessed someone in extreme pain, a car accident, whatever it might have been, 
Fishing hooks don't count. Those of you who went to Canva. Um, extreme pain. But there's a lot of truth that can be taken from someone who was afraid because there is believers who are afraid and they do the same thing. They dig and they bury their talent and then they have nothing at the end. So here we go with some application. First thing I want you to know is this. To live with less and, and, to, and so you can have more, you're going to have to give ownership, meaning giving everything I have belongs to God. God invested in you. Think about that for just a few seconds here. God invested in you. What was God's greatest investment in you? What was it? What was God's greatest investment for you, me, the whole world? His son, Jesus Christ, was given. He invested in you and me. He gave Jesus Christ. I want you to know this morning, I know there's a lot of believers here this morning, but there might be just one person here that doesn't know that Jesus was given for you. And I want you to realize that Jesus was not only given for you, but for the whole world, that that anyone could come to know Christ. Anyone would know that Jesus' blood was what would it it take to pay for the sins of the world, and so Jesus was willing to do that. I want you to understand, if you don't know heaven is your home, that Jesus did invest in you, and he paid the price for you. Many times I hear people might say this, I don't have any talents. Look at the person next to you and say that. Tell them, say, I don't have any talents. Go ahead and tell them. And then which I want you to reply, I want you to go, oh, really? All right. Really? You don't have any talents? I didn't see you tell your wife, Rusty. I'm watching you back there. You better participate. We all have talents. Think about this. I want you to think about talents a little differently because until I studied this, I didn't quite think about it this way. Think about your talents in this way. Your abilities, that's one that we always go to. But what about this one? Uh, We don't think about this one much when we think about talents. Is your resources. I'm not talking about money, but I'm talking about other resources that you have. Connections, people you know. How are you utilizing the resources that God has given to you, the relationships that God has given to you? How is that benefiting the kingdom of God? Your resources, your skills, but here's another one I never really thought about until I studied this a little more, and that is opportunities. Let that soak in for a minute. The opportunities that I have been given. How am I investing who I am with the opportunities God has provided for me? I have an opportunity to do this, or I have an opportunity to do that. I have this change in my life, so now I have this opportunity. What am I doing with the opportunities I have have been given? Am I giving ownership to God in those opportunities? Am I giving um, ownership to God in the resources that he's given to me? Am I giving it back to him, realizing it's from him? Anything that God has entrusted you, your wife, your children, your job, can be considered a talent. So give that ownership. Next thing, be accountable. Be accountable. Be accountable. Why do I need to do this? God expects me to use everything. God expects me to use everything. God expected them to use the first guy that had five talents. Did he say, hey, good and faithful servant, you used four talents. I'm very proud of you. You wasted one, but you did good with four. Did he say that, yes or no? No, he did not say that. So he used everything. When it came to the guy with two talents, did he use half of it or all of it? He used all of it, everything. Many times we we make these analogies and think that God doesn't want me to use everything, but he absolutely does. Be accountable. God expects me to use everything. God has made an investment in my life, and he expects to have a return. Think about this at tax time. What about my spiritual life? What if if I was given an audit? What if I was going to have to give an accounting of my life? Am I ready for that? I don't know if I'm ready for that this morning. Are you ready? I don't know if you're ready. Sometimes we're more ready than other times, but this is the point where we invest and say, I want to be ready. God is going to ask this question. Here it is. What did you do with what I gave you? What did you do with what I gave you? Not talking about what's in your bank account. That's not really what he's, what he's talking about. That's part of those things. But what about those opportunities? What about those resources? What about the God-given brains that you might have? 
Maybe about the, the, uh, the hands that you have, the talents that just lie in your hands, the things that you can do. So be accountable. Next thing, we'll move quickly. Some of you are going to sleep. Uh, be utilized, all right? Be utilized. Everybody say, use me. In America, we don't like to say, use me, because that means it's going to cost you more than you want to pay, and someone else is going to benefit, right? That's right, Brownie, right? But here's the thing, is we need to be utilized. It's wrong to compare or to bury what God gave you. This is where we make mistakes. We start comparing. Well, uh, he got five. I only got one. He got two. I only got one. How is this fair? How is this fair? Fair is not a biblical principle when you really think about it. Uh, God gives to us what God wants us to have, and God has a plan for what he has given to you. And I want you to realize that it is wrong for us to compare. It's wrong for us to bury. You notice in this passage, Jesus does not say the two that were called good and what? Good and faithful. All right, The good and faithful were not, were not told, hey, well, um, you did pretty good. He said, you've done, you've done well. You've done well. You've done what I've asked you to do. You didn't compare. You didn't go and bury it. You did what I asked you to do. You, you went and you did something. Uh, many times we like to play it safe. We don't like to risk. Um, is there risks needed in life? Yes or no? Financially, a lot of times we make a financial risk to, to make a gain. A lot of times we make other risks I want us to realize this, Romans chapter 14, 23, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. What do I mean by this? Let's go a little further. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, without faith it is impossible to, please God, in everything, if everything is safe, you don't need any faith. If everything is just safe, you don't need any faith. Here's where I'm going with this. Doing nothing is inexcusable, really to God. Doing nothing for Matt Burns is inexcusable. Doing more than what I'm capable of doing, that's acceptable to God. Relying on him, using my faith and saying, God, I, I can't do this, but you're there. You can take my obedience and do something with it. So I'm going to give it and I'm going to let you use it, whatever that is, however that is. So don't play it safe. Use your faith. Here's a thought for you. I'd rather accept to do something great and fail than to attempt to do nothing and succeed. How am I investing? What am I doing with the talents? A pastor once said something that four words he wanted on his tombstone Tombstone, at least he tried. <laughs> at least he tried. Or he said, you can say, at least he invested, we could say this morning. So what do you think? Here's a question. From this story from Jesus, which person would you think? The person with five talents or the person with two or the person with one was the most likely person to dig or to sit on what God gave him? Out of your mind, if you were pondering this, not knowing the end of the story, all right, so if one of the three guys is going to dig in the earth and bury what he's been given, will it be the guy with five, the guy with two, or one? How many of you say the guy with five? If you didn't know the end of the story, the guy with five, he's going to take it and bury it. All right, how many of the guy with two? I thought I'd get it. You know, some of you are just not voting because you're going to be like, I'm going to do the right answer. So well, it's more stupid. How many of you would honestly say the guy with one? How many of you would say that? And how many of you don't have a clue? A lot of hands should have just went up because a lot of you didn't vote. Paul, what did you say? I didn't see your hand go up. One. Okay. Just checking. Which one would we pick? Well, it is the one with one, obviously. Here's what we a lot of times think, and it's just like this guy with one. If I'm a, just a one-talent person, all right? If I'm just a one-talent person, then I'm not a superstar. 
This is how a lot of times we approach life when we approach ministry, involving and risking our, our comfort zone to help be a blessing to someone else. Well, I'm just a one-talent person. I'm not a superstar. I'm not going to do anything. I'll let the pros do it. I don't have ten talents. They do. Since I only have one, I'm just going to bury it. I'm not going to use it. Don't think like that. Don't use those those fear taxes, because that's what they are. They're from, from Satan. That's his attack to us. Many times what happens is when people do that, this is what happens. When you bury and you dig, your Christian life becomes um, more about a routine than a relationship. You get in this routine, and you're not, you're not using your talents. You're not using who you are, what God made you to be. God wants us to be utilized. We're going to move a little faster. The next one is this. Be motivated. All right? Everybody say, be motivated. Be motivated. Fear keeps us from using and developing our talents. God has more talents for you. This is where we have a misconception, too. We think, all right, I got all the talents I was ever going to get. I got them now. God's not going to give me any more. But God will stretch you. God will give you more talents. God will bless what he's already given to you if you'll go and use it. So be motivated to, uh, to not allow fear to, to cripple you in this area. Don't play it safe. Here's a couple things Satan does. Three things. I'm going to go fast here. Satan has three kinds of fear. Self-doubt, self-pity, and self-consciousness. I'm going to say them again. Some of us need to write them down just so we can evaluate it. Self-doubt. How many have ever worked with that one? Raise your hand. Self-doubt. Uh, what about self-pity? Anybody ever use that one? Self-pity? Uh, self-consciousness. How about that one? We've used it, right? Satan uses these things in our life, and he, he tries to get us to believe uh, these areas and self-doubt. This is what he's saying is, uh, I can never do that. I'm not qualified. That's the fear of failure. That's the fear of self-doubt. How many times in school... Uh, did the, the, the teacher ask a question? You know the answer, and you went like this. Ah, it's too big of a risk. If I answer that question and I'm wrong, what am I going to look like? Yeah, I'm going to look like a dork. I'm not going to know what I'm doing. I'm not going to look like the guy I want to be. If I get it wrong, I get it right, so i got a 50-50 chance. How many of you are good guessers? Any good guessers out there? My son is a great guesser. He can guess on a test and get... 90% on it. I mean, it's crazy. No, he is a smart kid. He's just not a good guesser. But anyway, uh, a lot of times that's what, what, what we'll do is we won't take that risk. We won't raise the hand. We won't get involved. We say, say things like, you know, I just, I'm not qualified. I'm afraid. Um, I'm not going to do it. Self-pity. I've failed in the past so many times. I made attempts one time or a couple times to get involved for God and uh, I end up getting burned on it. And you get a bad situation from it. Or maybe I got burned out from it. Self-pity. When we think about this, I want you to think about two Bible characters, Judas and Peter. Sometimes we forget that Peter, after he denied Christ, how many times did he do it? three times, that just 50 days later was the greatest success of that era of his time. 50 days later is when 3,000 people believed in Christ and got baptized. That was just 50 days after his greatest failure. He needed to not play it safe. He needed to take the risk. It doesn't matter so much where you've been. Listen to me. It doesn't matter so much where you've been. What matters is the direction your feet are when you land. Where are you going? What are you going to do next? Don't let Satan defeat you with these fears. Where you're headed right now is what counts. The past is just the garbage you need to forget. It's where do you want to go, not where you've been. Will the rest of my life be the best of my life? Ask that question. Say it with me. Will the rest of my life Be the best of my life. Say it with me. Will the rest of my life be the best of my life? You're not participating very well. 
Will the rest of my life be the best of my life? I'll say it again. Will the best... I just said it wrong. Will the rest of my life be the best of my life? It will be if I learn to live with less so I can live with more. If I learn to not play it safe and I learn to take risks and put myself out there and say, okay, God, I'm going to just do something because I know I need to do something. I'm going to get invested. Last thought and we'll be done. Be pliable. Be pliable. If you don't use it, you lose it. It's the same universally no matter where you go. If you don't use your muscles, you're going to lose them. If you don't use your mind, you're going to lose it. Uh, If you don't use the opportunities God has given to me in business, sports, ministry, or whatever, you're going to lose the opportunity. So the question is, what are your resources? What are your opportunities? What are your abilities? And what are you doing with them? What am I doing with them? God, help me to do what I need to be doing with the things you've given to me. If I don't practice with my talents, I lose my talents. So with those things said this morning, would you just do this for me? Will you buy our heads, close your eyes for just a minute? A time of decision. Will the rest of my life be the best of my life? Live with less so I can live with more. Will I say, no, I'm going to make that less in my life so I can make this more in my life? What department needs to have the less categories and what topics or headings need to be under what's going to have more in my life? How am I investing? When it's all said and done, when Jesus was telling his disciples, when it's all said and done, what will you hear and what will you say? As we finish this morning with just your evaluation of the Holy Spirit in your life right now, is we will receive compensation. If we use my talents, I will have a reward. All three of these areas, affirmation, well done. Promotion, I'm going to give you a greater responsibility and then celebration to enter into the joy of my Lord. Maybe this last couple of weeks, and maybe you weren't able to make it to the vision night there the other night, and and you know God has said a couple things to you. Hey, this is where I want you to be obedient. I want you to be obedient in in giving uh, the portion I've asked you to give back in the area of finances. Maybe um, it's in a different area of service that you need to be involved in, or maybe you need to just ask someone, hey, Matt, where, where can I get invested? This is what I enjoy. This is what I like to do. But where can I get invested? Where can, when my life is over, I have more where it needs to have more and less where it needs to have less. We're going to do the invitation a little bit different this morning. You know and and, and God knows what has been said to you. I'm not going to try to ask Mary to sing 15 verses to try to get as many people to the altar this morning. Uh, One day we're going to talk to the Lord and we're going to see him face to face and he's going to say, hey, I talked to you in that service and I really wish you would have went forward and talked to me. There was an altar made there specifically for people to come. And that's what this altar is for, for you to communicate with God. It's not for you to come up here and and think that you're um, going to give all the repentance of your whole life. It's not always about repentance. A lot of times it's about obedience. But whatever it is that God has said to you, maybe you don't know that Jesus Christ is your Savior. You say, Matt, today I've got questions about that. We want to talk to you about those questions. So please, with, without no one looking around, no one making any um, observation of anyone else except for yourself, I'm going to ask Marion to start that first verse. As soon as I pray, I'm going to ask you to remain seated. Remain seated. If God has said something to you when he starts to sing, I want you to just don't hesitate. I want you to obey. I want you to step out. I want you to come and talk to God. Maybe you've not filled out the uh, decision card that we've been talking about the last couple of weeks. You're like, hey, I need to do that. They're here at the altar. Say, hey, this is where God has spoken to me. Whatever God has spoken to you about, you speak to him about this morning.